there I go, my intellectual quote for the video. Strong, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men create bad times. And our politicians and leaders are those same weak men today. We do not have the gall to speak out against the oncoming storm that is Islam. It is not a form of oppression. Specifically for the 1-5% to of people watching this that actually don't understand. Because I reckon 99% of my audience are like, yes lord, we get it. But here we go. I'll give Lauren Southern credit for this. She didn't have to make this video about a month back called Addressing My Biggest Criticism. She probably didn't have to make it since I doubt her viewers would have taken the criticism very seriously even if they had heard about it. And frankly, she's not winning over her critics with this video anyway. But before we get ahead of ourselves, what is she here to talk about? What is her biggest criticism? My ideas led to the Christchurch attack. Wow, that's quite the criticism. Okay, good on Lauren for addressing it head on. It looks like she had already responded to the criticism via Twitter back in February when people were talking about it because of her getting a spot on a Sky News program in Australia. But since the criticism apparently has continued, I guess Lauren decided to address it in video form. She is a YouTuber anyways. So let's see how this goes. I love when people address criticism about themselves. Now you may be wondering why would anyone be accusing some YouTuber of inspiring a terrorist attack anyway? Well, in part because the terrorist who committed the Christchurch mosque murders in New Zealand, killing 51 people, titled his manifesto The Great Replacement. And as Lauren acknowledges, she produced a video in 2017 also called The Great Replacement. So what though? It's a bit of a title overlap. It's not like the content was similar, right? Well, stay with me here. If you're not familiar with the concept of this great replacement idea, it's the idea of white people being replaced by people of color, or European people being quote unquote replaced by people not born in countries in Europe. And while the general idea has been around for a while, this term specifically was popularized by French author Renaud Camus. I'm sorry, Renaud? I, I, I'm sorry. We'll just call him Camus. And as you can tell by the color choice for the book cover he put out, usually the people of color discussed as quote-unquote replacing white or European people are people of the Islamic faith. So, since it's not usually a good look to have a video titled the same thing as a terrorist's manifesto, Lauren begins by explaining that yes, she got her 2017 video's title from the source, the guy Kemu, who coined the term, but that she didn't know much about him and she tries to distance herself from his views. I only did a very brief Google search of him before doing so. I decided to make this video after learning about the idea that Europeans were going to become a minority in Europe from The Guardian. I decided to try to find any intellectuals who had criticisms of this and what problems this may cause. I found Camus, it said he was a left-wing philosopher, and I thought he would be good to quote. Now, this article from 2000 in The Guardian she refers to cites four different academics who viewed the demographic shift as a bad thing, so I'm not sure I believe that Lauren had to go searching for an academic who was against it and ended up finding Camus. But anyway, let's hear Lauren quote the old video and try to show that her views have differences from those of Camus and by extension, differences from the terrorist manifesto. You'll notice the only quotes I used from him were ones of him saying, we can't replace one group with another group of people without losing unique cultures. Despite various misrepresentations, Camus does not oppose current immigration policy out of racism or Islamophobia, but on the basis of the preservation of French traditions and culture. This didn't seem very controversial to me at all, and in fact, it seemed pretty damn similar to the comments made from those lamenting the loss of Native American peoples and cultures. While preserving French culture and tradition is a fine goal, I guess, prioritizing this is not similar to prioritizing preserving indigenous cultures, since the destruction of the latter was in all cases entirely intentional and deliberate, whereas increased immigration leading to decreased demographic or cultural dominance of white or European populations is not deliberate or intentional. Oh, but wait! What 
I didn't learn about Camus, of course, in a very brief Google search was that he had further theories about this all being a deliberate and calculated plan. Things I never asserted nor discussed in the video I made. So Lauren titled her video after this guy's theory while only having done a Google search so brief that she didn't realize he viewed the diminishing dominance of white cultures as intentional. If it wasn't intentional, why would it be called a replacement? Something being replaced almost always implies intentionality, I would think. Otherwise, it would be called the great shift or something, and it would be more neutral since it wouldn't imply a loss. If you want a great video about Lauren's video on the Great Replacement, check out this one by Sean, by the way. But anyway, Lauren thinks she has made a distinction, that Camus' concept of the Great Replacement considered it intentional while hers didn't. So she goes on. Which brings me to the second issue with this assertion. Some would say that my defense that I didn't come up with the Great Replacement theory is moot because I popularized it, I made it huge, and therefore he likely learned it from me and got radicalized by this. Which, like every other point I have brought up before, is just completely false. Good on Lauren for bringing up this criticism that she popularized the racist theory that Muslim people and other people of color are intentionally destroying quote unquote the West. Let's hear why this is false in her words, and in this clip she's going to refer to a commission report published in New Zealand about the terrorist attack. Anyone who has taken two minutes to read the commission report, which obviously none of these people who speak with a lot of authority on it seem to have done, would know this claim is impossible. I published my video in July 2017. The official report clearly shows the shooter had made up his mind to commit a terror attack in January of 2017, six months before I published my video, a video that deranged progressives will claim caused this massacre. So not only are Lauren's critics apparently deranged, they won't even take the time to read the report that apparently exonerates Lauren. Well, I took some time to look at it and let's see the rest of that segment she quoted. It says, we are satisfied that by January 2017, the individual had a terrorist attack in mind. We are also satisfied that when the individual came to live in New Zealand on the 17th of August, 2017, it was with a fully developed terrorist ideology based on his adoption of the Great Replacement Theory and his associated beliefs that immigration, particularly by Muslim migrants into Western countries, is an existential threat to Western society, and that the appropriate response, at least for him, was violence. Much of this information about the terrorist's intent comes from his Great Replacement Manifesto, where we can learn in more detail that from April through May 2017, he came to his conclusion that violence was his answer to the problem he viewed as existing. Now notice we're not saying that it was in 2017 that he developed his views of Muslim people as invaders destroying Western civilization, but just that in 2017 was when he decided on violence being his answer. This was, in his words, because of three things in those months of 2017. An Islamist terrorist attack, an election in France, and his personal experience being in France and seeing people he already had developed the view of as invaders. So he already viewed Muslim immigrants as invaders months before Lauren's Great Replacement video, so how could she bear even the slightest responsibility for promoting such a view? Well, I guess it would be a bit more complicated if Lauren's Great Replacement video didn't come out of nowhere, right, but in fact was a logical next step for her in her career of public commentary? Let's take a stroll down memory lane and check out Lauren's early videos on her YouTube channel to find out Oh, 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 that's an unfortunate thumbnail. Wow, okay. Signaling disrespect of the Islamic faith by making the thumbnail an image of her appropriating the way some Muslim women dress. A thumbnail that she actually had to go out of her way to make, by the way, since she doesn't even wear that in the video, which I guess is a good thing, obviously. And then we have this, the second video that's currently listed on her channel called Kukada, which if your brain is less poisoned by the internet than mine is, I'll explain that it's a mixture of 
the word cuck, as in a man who enjoys someone sleeping with his romantic partner, and Canada, as in the country. The word cuck is used on the internet often to refer generally to someone being submissive, so what is Canada submissive about? Well, this one was interesting in that it was the first video I'd ever seen of Lauren's that didn't include commentary. It's essentially a music video, propagandizing the idea that Canada and its prime minister specifically is submissive to several things, to feminism and to the immigration of Muslim people. You may have noticed that this thumbnail prominently features the prime minister around Muslim people, apparently at a mosque, so that's another thumbnail choice Lauren made for whatever reason, and to signal whatever message, maybe a disrespect of an entire religion, I, I don't know. But anyway, let's watch a very short clip because this one's a bit much and I don't know if I can even use the music. <laughs> Gamergate and video games uh, and misogyny in, in popular culture uh, is something that we need people to stand clearly against. Oh no, misogyny is something we need to stand against? How could a leader ever say such a thing? And if we rewind, what was that article Lauren edited in there? Ah, okay, right. Uh, so back in February of 2016, Lauren was already producing what I would consider very well-designed propaganda in our internet age. And no doubt she was ingratiating herself with the alt-right by vice signaling a distaste for feminism and mocking the idea of misogyny being a problem and promoting the idea that Muslim immigration is the real problem that we need to worry about. I found myself wondering if there were videos from back then that she deleted, so I used a website Wayback Machine to investigate. It looks like she deleted a lot of these early videos, but all of them were seemingly specifically about her views about feminism, none seeming by the thumbnail and title to target Muslim people. I got intrigued though by all the deleted content, and since I knew she deleted this great replacement video from 2017 that we've been talking about previously, I went to see if there were others from around that time that she had deleted. I figured this would help us understand just how much Lauren's Great Replacement video was or was not an outlier in her work. Here we can see the Great Replacement video, and then if we scroll down, a month earlier she made a now-deleted video called The Nightmare of Mass Immigration. I wonder if she used the word invaders in that one. Here's another deleted one called Generation Identity, Europe's Youth Reconquista. I wonder why Lauren deleted that one, and whether it has anything to do with the Generation Identity group being a well-known far-right movement that is described, for instance, by one article in this way. While there are of course differences between the frames employed by the various generation identity groups, all of these frames are intrinsically linked. Moreover, at their core, they all lead to the same conclusion. Due to the existential threat that Muslim immigrants pose to the European autochthonous, autochthonous population, there should be no Muslim immigrants or refugees in Europe. The group's perspective, quote, revolves around the conviction that Europe is currently undergoing a great replacement process. Hey, that sounds familiar, and hey, that's that Camus guy again. Oh, and look, the group fears becoming, quote, the Indians of Europe. That's interesting, since Lauren, in this video we're here to talk about today, used the analogy of demographic shift and genocide of indigenous peoples, as we showed earlier. What a coincidental framing device. She just happened to use the same one that these generations identity people use. And another framing these generation identity people use is defend Europe. So just tuck that away for a moment, please. And oh, but wait, there is something we haven't mentioned about the video's title that we were just talking about, which was Generation Identity, Europe's Youth Reconquista. If you're like me, you may not immediately know what Reconquista refers to. Well, buddy, it's apparently a period of history starting back in the 700s when Christian people won a bunch of battles against Muslim people, killed a lot of Muslim people, and took a lot of land from them. And apparently a part of its 
its modern legacy is being used by far-right groups as a symbol to shape political discourse around all these same issues that Lauren apparently discussed at length in old and deleted videos. So now with all this new information, I ask again, I wonder why Lauren deleted this old video called Generation Identity, Europe's Youth Reconquista that she released a month before an also deleted video called The Nightmare of Mass Immigration. Oh, and what about that video in between where she's interviewing someone from a group who aims to apparently safeguard European heritage? Is that one deleted? Yeah. If Lauren Southern was a legitimate journalist covering these admittedly newsworthy groups, why did she delete the videos? Doesn't she want people to learn about these dangerous movements? Or was that not how she was covering them, maybe? Anyway, I'm showing that in the summer of 2017, Lauren had taken huge strides from her early 2016 meme videos ridiculing Justin Trudeau for supporting feminism and for not blaming Muslim people in general for terrorist attacks. Lauren was no longer just making memes, she was making connections with groups, and we know she wasn't just covering them for content, she was actively pursuing the same activist causes along with them, which we'll talk more about soon. So we've spent some time going through the videos that Lauren was making in June 2017 before her Great Replacement video that came out in July 2017. But we know that the terrorist who killed 51 people in New Zealand had formulated his decision that violence was his answer to the threat of the Great Replacement that he perceived. He had formulated this by May 2017. So of course we haven't proven that she could have radicalized this man. Even if those videos about generation identity and the nightmare of mass immigration were possible for us to watch, I can assure you Lauren at no point directly advocates violence. I guess I could be wrong, but I don't think she's that stupid. Rather than trying to prove that Lauren directly radicalized this terrorist, I want to ask why, in this Addressing My Biggest Criticism video, does she do such a poor job of actually addressing the criticism of herself and her actions? For reasons we'll get into, I think it's possible and even likely that this terrorist attack would have happened the exact same way, even if Lauren had never existed. However, frankly, I think it's possible that it wouldn't have. Because she puts a pretty face on ugly ideas, and she has made it her job for years to make the exact, exact same accusations of Muslims in general that the terrorist made. For instance, do you remember how one of the terrorist's main reasons for deciding on violence was his view of the 2017 French election, and how another reason was his personal experience in France? At one point, he wrote that in his opinion, for every French man or woman, there was double the number of invaders. Coincidentally, Lauren has also demonstrated a preoccupation with the exact same thing, as we can see from her video The Streets of Paris, which she put out back in 2017, about one week after her Great Replacement video. The Streets of Paris video was the second one I found of Lauren's where there's no talking or commentary because she doesn't need to talk to spread propaganda, she's just that good. I'm not gonna play the music because it's just someone else is, but it's it's this synthwave track, and, and you might be thinking, oh, well, hey, this is just a fun travel video with music in the background, right? She's just walking around Paris. What's the big deal? Well, you might not be seeing the video how her audience sees it. Her audience knows what's up. They know what she's saying, and many, many comments have no problem perceiving the message, a message which aligns in a direct one-to-one -one relationship with the message of the terrorist. Also, according to one article, the video's previous description was a lot more direct than its current one. It used to read, France is changing forever due to mass immigration. France will not be France for long. This is what the commission report means when it talks about the terrorist view of Muslim immigrants as an existential threat. The existence of France is being challenged. Its identity, France will not be France for long. Its metaphysical being is under threat in her portrayal to her audience. Now, as we saw, Lauren would probably say she's just worried about French culture and tradition, but her history of spreading hate against Muslim people kind of says something different. For
For instance, her history of calling Muslim people barbarians, like in this epic tweet clapback to J.K. Rowling from February 2017 in regards to Rowling's comments to Piers Morgan talking about the Muslim ban the previous U.S. president inflicted on people. Oh wait, Lauren deleted it? I wonder why. Well, what about her entire book she published titled Barbarians, How Baby Boomers, Immigrants, and Islam Screwed My Generation? She can't delete that. That was in 2016 she published that. Unfortunately, even people who agree with Lauren didn't like it, since she apparently isn't anti-Semitic enough, and also she sucks at writing. Now, I would never ask you to judge a book by its cover and title, so let's go back to that article discussing Lauren where we learned that one point she makes in the book is to blame Muslim people for the Holocaust. Lauren wrote, As far as I'm concerned, Hitler was just an SJW who happened to get freaky amounts of power and actually implement his hashtag kill all Jews the predecessor to hashtag kill all men worldview. Basically, if Hitler were writing today, he could have avoided all the verbiage in Mein Kampf and just complained about Jew splaining on Tumblr, and the message would be the same. Oh, and another problem I have with Hitler? He fawned over Muslims more sycophantically than Justin Trudeau. B.B. Netanyahu was right to point out that Hitler decided on the Holocaust partly because Middle Eastern Muslims told him they didn't want Jews expelled into the region. First of all, if you ever find yourself writing the phrase, oh, and another problem I have with Hitler, you have ventured far, far off course. Just a little note there. And if you aren't familiar, this reference Lauren makes to Netanyahu is her supporting an absolutely ridiculed and wrong idea he spread the year before to hype up anti-Islam sentiment for some reason. If you're into historical accuracy, you may want to know that over two years before Hitler met the Muslim man being blamed here on November 28, 1941, Hitler had addressed the Reichstag, Nazi Germany's parliament, and spoke clearly about his determination to exterminate the Jewish race. More than two years before, okay? So not cool to blame Muslims here, people, and no respectable historian thinks this is correct. Even Netanyahu's defense minister and close ally said he was wrong. Was he doing it to flare up tensions against Muslim people for some specific reason or just for some dilly-dallying in historical editing? And why is Lauren unquestionably repeating it and supporting it in her 2016 book called Barbarians about how Islam screwed her generation? Huh. Interesting. I wonder if this is part of a pattern of propagandizing anti-Islam sentiment to right-wing audiences. Looking through Lauren's career, we're not going to find a smoking gun where she says that murder is what her viewers should do. But we have found a pattern of behavior denigrating Muslims, have we not? I couldn't find anywhere she called Muslim immigrants invaders, but I don't think that means she never has, and I ask how significant the semantic difference really is between using the word invader on the one hand and on the other creating the body of work Lauren has with the singular message that white European people are threatened by Muslim immigration. It's about time we went back to the video we're here today to discuss, don't you think? With all this background information in mind. But one more thing before we do. If you've heard anything about Lauren Southern, you probably already know why I asked you a little while ago to tuck away the phrase defend Europe. In the summer of 2017, which was also when she put out that great replacement video, Lauren publicly supported a fundraiser to take a boat out into the Mediterranean to disrupt ships from literally saving drowning refugees. The stated goal of the boat she was on was to monitor the NGOs that rescue migrants off the coast of Italy, as well as picking up migrants stranded in the waters and returning them to Libya, which could well be breaking human rights legislation. The ship was operated by Defend Europe, which was set up by a French group called Generation Identity. Huh, that sounds familiar. And oh look, Lauren didn't just raise money for the cause, she went on the boat herself, putting her money where her xenophobic mouth is, or rather putting her mouth where the xenophobic money is.
And ironically, when the ship Lauren was on was detained, there were 21 people from Sri Lanka on board, five of whom claimed asylum in northern Cyprus. So Lauren and a company set out to obstruct immigration and they facilitated it, but this whole thing helped raise Lauren's profile immensely, showing she wasn't all talk, but she was ready to, quote, do something. And while it may not involve shooting a gun, it involved attempted forcible transfer of human beings which is also not good. Okay, time to return to Lauren's response to the criticism she's received with all this information in mind. If you recall, we last left Lauren when she was saying that her rhetoric never could have inspired the terrorism in New Zealand since her video about the Great Replacement idea came out in July 2017 when this guy had already decided on violence a whole two months earlier. Now, I think it's worth asking whether someone decides something Thing like he did and decides it forever, or whether further information and media they expose themselves to may have either a validating or an invalidating effect on that decision, but Lauren doesn't go there, she just acts like it. if his mind was made up, her video must have had zero influence. And she certainly doesn't mention the work she'd done in the year prior to that video to drum up anti-Islam sentiment, but what she does say is this. I'm not sure if this guy has a time machine. But the math isn't really adding up to me. Unless we want to start blaming people who talk about communism on YouTube for directly causing the deaths of millions in Soviet Russia years ago, this argument is absurd. It is far more likely the shooter heard about the Great Replacement concept the exact same way I did, from the mainstream media, who have been touting the notion that immigration to Europe will lead to an eventual white minority for years even well before this horrible person was radicalized. Declining white population and replacement has been featured as headline stories in almost every major mainstream outlet. NPR, The Guardian, CBC, all of these places have mentioned the idea, said it was real, and even celebrated it for some reason. What a laughable idea to Lauren that people could celebrate demographic shifts rather than be afraid or worried about them. The thing is, if someone reads all these neutral or positive articles about demographic shifts, they're not going to be as likely to be radicalized as they would be if they were engrossed in media portraying this demographic shift as an existential threat, being ignored by cucked politicians. Well, I absolutely think there are worthy criticisms of the data in my video, The Great Replacement, and the arguments I've made. And I have since removed it for more reasons than just that, but my hatred of the association with this horrific individual, it is really just insane that some people can simultaneously call me a dangerous conspiracy theorist while not applying the same standards to every outlet that has published the same idea as fact. Because there's a difference between facts and commentary, obviously. You can't have it both ways. True when someone is celebrating mass immigration, but an evil, dangerous conspiracy when someone is criticizing it. I don't think Lauren is stupid enough to believe what she just said. Of course something can be a true fact in one sense, and then people can have dangerous conspiracies about it in their analysis and criticism of that fact. This is incredibly obvious. For instance, we could look at, say, the percentage of people in Hollywood who are Jewish, which I don't feel like searching for, but it doesn't matter. It could be a disproportionately high percentage, and that could be a relatively neutral fact fact, or a fact explained by a variety of factors, but then anti-Semitic people could say, well, that fact is a bad thing, and is explained this way, and those Jewish people have this power in the media, and here's how they got their power, and here's what it will lead to if we don't take it away, and so on. Conspiracy theories and dangerous ideologies are obviously always going to be built off of some small truths, and they're dangerous not for the truth they contain, but the way they distort the truth to drum up hatred against a group. Obvious. Let's just go over the facts once more before I move on. I am not named in the commission report once. Yep, it's true that Lauren isn't named in the commission report. She's also not named in the manifesto, unlike Candace Owens. However, the terrorist was radicalized by the internet, as he said in his manifesto, and as the commission report confirmed. His perspective was informed by YouTube in particular, not by reading articles in The Guardian and The New York Times, if you can believe it. And as far as content similarities, the terrorist in his manifesto obsesses over fertility rates, a subject Lauren has covered 
often as an apparently serious issue, including in this Facebook post from right around the time of her Great Replacement video where she says, Weird how they always use white children in the thumbnail when they tell us we need to have less children, isn't it? Even weirder how they then tell us we need to flood our countries with migrants to stop population decline, isn't it? This is what I mean when I say spreading misinformation and conspiracy theories. There is absolutely no direct link between me and the shooter. It is quite literally impossible for my video to have radicalized him. There shouldn't need to be a direct link or for one specific video to have radicalized him. Lauren, as a public figure, should have the maturity, the self-awareness, and the pattern recognition abilities to understand the total effect her career is having, since as we've seen, she has a history of focusing on and framing subjects in the exact same way this terrorist did. What I'm saying is we shouldn't need to prove causation. She should be answering for the extremely strong correlation. Going by the logic of journalists and activists analyzing the Christchurch massacre, I have identified five main categories they seem to point to for guilt. Association, donation, content consumption, shared opinion, and named inspiration. Let's go over donations first. This seems really damn simple, and I hate that I even have to explain it, but content creators have no control over who donates to them. More so, even if it's not an anonymous donation, which many are, most people do not have the time nor ability to do a full background check on every single person who engages with them. So she's saying this because the terrorists donated to the exact same types of groups she was involved in. But ask yourself this, why is Lauren acting like her critics are saying she should have been aware of the donation or she should have like refused it or something? Of course that's not the criticism. The criticism is obviously not that groups she's associated with accepted money from a future terrorist. The criticism is that a future terrorist wanted to donate to the same generation identity groups Lauren has promoted and been involved with and financially supported. Again, isn't that quite a significant correlation, one that would force an individual to think critically about the effect of their pattern of behavior? Like, hmm, why were groups that I was associated with attracting future terrorists? Now we get to the part where instead of thinking critically about any of this, Lauren starts making stupid and distracting comparisons to things that aren't comparable. The head of Weather Underground, William Myers, ran a campaign of terror attacks bombing public buildings, including the Pentagon. He donated $200 to Barack Obama's campaign. This does not make Barack Obama a terrorist. It's interesting that now, as we're zooming in on the act of donation, it seems like we're somehow forgetting that the manifesto also had the same title as Lauren's very popular 2017 video. So it's not just a donation in isolation, and it's not just a title similarity in isolation, right? Just ask yourself, is the relationship between the ideas Obama promoted and this other terrorist's acts as directly related to the relationship between the ideas Lauren promoted and her video and other work and the identical views of the terrorist who named his manifesto the same thing as her popular old video. I think one is a much looser relationship than the other. And lastly, shared views. This is likely the most compelling argument of the lot, however it is still unequivocally stupid, as nearly every single political ideology in history has had its crazies. So she's admitting she shares an ideology with the terrorist, right? That's what she just did, right? She just admitted that she shares an ideology with the terrorist. And while I agree that the terrorist was by some definition crazy, and I'm a therapist by the way, so I use that word pretty carefully, a lot of people are to some degree insane and out of touch with reality. The point is whether you're the one feeding red meat to their insanity. The terrorist was insane enough to think he needed to use violence to achieve the goals Lauren has consistently portrayed and promoted as of existential importance, safeguarding so-called European white people from Muslim immigrants. Now look at how low Lauren stoops to try to criticize her critics. In her argument, if we want to give her any amount of responsibility, any at all, for the violence in New Zealand, not only must we blame Obama for terrorism too, but we must actually blame the victims of terrorism. Oh gosh, Lauren, what an argument. More likely than not, Victims of a shooting are going to fit into one of these five categories, and you would be blaming them for their own deaths, if this is how you think about these situations. 
abhorrent, terrible argument. As if a victim of a shooting supporting a political candidate that the shooter also supported shares as much responsibility for the violence as a political commentator on YouTube spreading in videos, books, and actions the exact same conspiracy theory that inspired a manifesto and a mass murderer. Myself and others are not responsible for the actions of evil people who either followed, quoted, said similar things, or are loosely associated to us. I used to think it was really damn clever to point out that moderate Muslims and terrorists said similar things. Oh my gosh, look, they both said Allahu Akbar. They both pledged their allegiance to God. That's pretty bad, pretty bad stuff. Until I spent a couple of seconds considering the fact that there's just a bit, a bit of a colossal gap between picking up a Quran and saying, huh, there's some interesting ideas in here, let me post a few verses to my Instagram, and deciding to fly a plane into buildings, or blowing yourself up at an Ariana Grande concert. Just like there is just a bit of a massive difference between having criticisms of immigration or worries about global warming and wanting to kill people because of said criticisms or worries. And this difference matters. It really, really matters. Think about the comparison she's making. Or I guess it's a comparison of comparisons or of relationships. On the one hand, we have the relationship between someone reading the Quran and an Islamist terrorist. And on the other hand, we have the relationship between someone promoting the Great Replacement idea and someone motivated to kill over it. A more realistic comparison would be comparing someone who reads fundamentalist Islamist literature online, watches fundamentalist Islamist videos, and so on and comparing that person to an Islamist terrorist. And yes, I would say that people preaching fundamentalist Islam and portraying, for instance, people in the US as evil or inhuman or something, I would say that propagandizing such information makes someone to a certain extent responsible for people who commit violence based on these exact same ideas. Obviously, we mainly blame the person committing the violence. However, there's certainly more blame to go around, y'all. And when the only difference between the message of an existential threat and the terrorism is that the terrorists thought the message about an existential threat was worth committing violence over, that's a much smaller difference than the difference between a broad message of a holy book or religion in general and the actions of fundamentalists. To drive the point home, okay, Lauren mentions moderate Muslim people and fundamentalist Muslim people using the phrase Allahu Akbar. However, that's not the same as her promoting the idea of the Great Replacement and the terrorist also believing in the Great Replacement. Why is it not the same? Let's see. Because one of these phrases has an enormous number of different usages in various contexts. And I find it hard to understand how someone like Lauren could compare this to the idea of the Great Replacement, which only means one thing. So anyone using that idea and believing in it and acting on it, whether it's making YouTube videos or committing terrorism, anyone believing in the Great Replacement has a much closer relationship with each other. Their ideologies are much closely, closer, closely are related. They share an ideology rather than just sharing use of the same words, which can mean like 10 or 20 different things. Which leaves me with two potential explanations for their behavior. One, none of these accusations of me being a terrorist actually come from a genuine place. Oh, so now we have moved the goalposts, and apparently her critics are accusing her of being a terrorist. While I'm sure some people have tweeted that at her, let's deal with the real criticism, okay? Which isn't that Lauren is a terrorist, but that she shares the exact ideology of these terrorists and differs only in not directly promoting violence to achieve the identical aims she portrays as of existential importance. Nice little bait and switch she's done with the criticism she's responding to. But there's also a second possibility, motivated reasoning. Scott Adams has often highlighted the idea that people are not optimized to think in terms of truth. Wait, wait a second. Who, who was that she cited? Scott Adams? The Dilbert comic guy? Well, hey, people can make generally uninspired comics and still have some good ideas, so maybe I shouldn't write off what she's referring to just yet. Let's check out what Scott's up to before we get back to Lauren. Oh, okay, he's got a YouTube channel. Let's check out a recent video. So, that's interesting, because it seems to me that whatever was driving the protest last year could not have been legitimate. Is there anybody who would disagree with that statement? That whatever was behind the, the protest last year, it couldn't have been legitimate because no problems were solved. Am I right? No. 
No, of course you're not right, you ignorant person. And yes, that audio, by the way, is how his video sounds, much to the pain of his audience. Oh, wait, but he addresses it in his unique way. Uh, there, by the way, for those of you on YouTube, there's a little sign in the back that might be useful to you. It says, Jesus King is, the audio is fine. Yes, Jesus King is, the audio is fine. Um, in case you're wondering, no, I have no idea what he's talking about or what he's doing with his life. But anyway, he's the one Lauren is citing as if he's an expert in human behavior. Scott Adams has often highlighted the idea that people are not optimized to think in terms of truth, but instead in terms of what will enable us to survive or what is most convenient for our survival. I mean, I would say that we're programmed to try to be in touch with the truth of our reality because that in itself is beneficial to our survival. But anyway, this brand of evolutionary pseudopsychology is pretty rife with issues, so let's let Lauren go on. So if someone has legitimately been convinced by the media or otherwise that I am an evil neo-Nazi who wants them and others to die, they are not going to think about me or about arguing with me on a rational basis. So now she's moved the goalposts so much that she's not responding to the criticism that her rhetoric can easily inspire violence. She's responding to this made up criticism that she's an evil neo-Nazi who wants them and others to die. Good job moving those goalposts, Lauren. Your arms must be tired. In this video where you attempt to address very real and significant criticisms of the impact of your life's work, you don't do a good job. Now watch her chastise her critics. I cannot even begin to express enough what a terrible idea it is to turn counter-terrorism into a high school notion of you can't sit with us. And that's what it's become. I'm not going to talk to or engage with you. I'm going to try to bully anyone else who tries to talk to or engage with you into not doing so because insert completely false slander. You didn't wear pink today, Lauren. You are in the out group. Out group? Wearing pink? What? We're criticizing you for promoting racist conspiracy theories, not wearing the wrong color. And we literally have senators doing this. Sky News, you can't associate with Lauren because she once said the same words as a terrorist. I will leave it up to you to figure out whether Lauren really thinks that she's being criticized simply for using the words great replacement, or whether she's consciously making this gross minimization of her years of work denigrating Islam and making out the immigration of Muslim people as an existential threat to quote unquote Western civilization in the exact same manner the terrorist who wrote the great replacement manifesto did. Anyway, this is how she ends her video. Just stop it, people. Stop it. Just pure stupidity, and I've had enough of it. Okay, so that's that. I think she did a bad job of addressing the criticism about her, and I hope I've explained why. Now, I wanna take us on one more stroll down memory lane before I close out. So let's look at this video Lauren made in March 2017. That is two months before the terrorist says, he decided violence was his answer to the problems he perceived. Lauren's video is called Why We'll Forget About London, which she made the day after an Islamist terrorist attack in London. She hadn't been making videos totally consistently at the time, but of course she couldn't wait more than a day to give her quote unquote insight about the attack. I found it an enlightening video, not just because she apparently prominently displays not just an Ayn Rand book on her shelf, but also like an absolute centrist, Herbert Marcuse. It's an interesting video because because of her message, which is, How have we gotten used to it? We here in the West are facing what I believe to be the biggest threat to our culture and way of life since the Cold War, and we're sitting here not even caring about it. And I know people will say they always go on about the talking points with, What about the Crusades? Well, that doesn't justify anything that is happening now. Or they'll say, You're more likely to be hit by lightning than to be attacked by a terrorist, Lauren. So not only is the West in danger, but apparently people aren't taking it seriously. And instead of Lauren responding to the more reasonable reply of, well, of course Islamist terrorism is a serious issue, however, I don't think the way you discuss it is productive, she replies instead to these imagined people saying the attacks are justified because of the Crusades. Lauren, what are you doing? Well, one thing she does in this video is she reiterates her problems with demographic shifts. And I can tell you right now that I don't think high birth rates in a rapidly growing immigrant community that suffers from rampant radicalization is a recipe for success. 
Uh, okay, that seems like a weird thing to say. Do you have a problem with the terrorism or the birth rate, Lauren? Then, in trying to make the point that people don't care about these things, she says this. We are not sacrificing our own lives. We will still get to go to the party tomorrow. We'll still have our Facebook and Snapchat and cute apartment and friends and we'll be good. But it is the futures of our children and their children and other people's children that we are sacrificing. Hmm, the futures of our children. Why does that sound familiar? Oh, right, the 14 words, the Nazi slogan. But I don't think I know of it from Wikipedia. Where else did I see? Oh, right in the manifesto, in the terrorist manifesto. But hey, it's not like Lauren actually said the 14 words precisely, right? She just said this. But it is the futures of our children and their children and other people's children that we are sacrificing. But I ask you this, given the context and the discussion of birth rates and her painting Islam as a threat to the West, does she really have to say all 14 words in order for people to see the connection? Let's hear some more. But because of this reality, the problems we are facing are so much bigger than just the already terrible problem of people genuinely wanting to destroy and transform Western culture into an Islamic one. Wow, destroy and transform Western culture into an Islamic one. That is some strong language. Lauren, what is holding us back from dealing with these issues, do you think? Because we not only have to deal with that, we have to deal with a sickness within ourselves and our own culture. A suicidal nihilism and pathological altruism. Suicidal nihilism stuck out to me as quite specific and strong phrasing, but I have to admit I wasn't even very surprised when I found the same phrase used not once but basically twice in the terrorist's manifesto. I just heard the phrase and I thought I wonder if he used it and he did. To be clear, for anyone who like Lauren does not grasp nuance, I'm not saying she caused terrorism because she uses the same words. I'm saying this correlation is not accidental, not random, but comes out of a shared ideology which brings us back to a clip we saw in the beginning of my video. There's an old saying that I think is extremely pertinent to what is going on right now, and that is that bad times create strong men. Strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men create bad times. And our politicians and leaders are those same weak men today who do not have the gall to speak out against the oncoming storm that is Islam. For fear of what? For fear of being called names. For fear of being called Islamophobe. So that old saying, by the way, which, which is just from four months before her video, is, is not just from a book, but it became a meme popular in, you guessed it, far-right circles. It would be used several months after Lauren's video by this guy, who clearly has good taste in romantic partners and is shockingly a neo-Nazi. I'm not saying, obviously, that anyone using this quote is a neo-Nazi. I'm saying that the correlation is significant and, again, not coincidental. And it's worth considering considering why these people align and, and how. But anyway, Lauren, please tell me, what should we do about this thing you're saying is such a huge and existential problem? We can't count on the politicians, right? You tell us that, you just said that, so what should we do? And now those values that others fought for, that created the good times, that many of us are still enjoying and experiencing now, are being sacrificed by a generation who refuses to fight. Oh. We should fight, huh? We should fight. What do you mean? We should fight. Fighting sounds violent, Lauren. Are you sure we should fight? Okay, then. Let alone even speak up in defense of their values today. I'm at a loss. I don't know what more I can say when we've already watched so much, so many tragic events happen as a result of this. All I can hope for now is that in the bad times to come, they create strong men. So you tell me, dear viewer, after watching all this, if you saw things how Lauren did, what would you feel motivated to do about it? How would you feel sitting back and doing nothing, or, you know, maybe calling your local politicians or something, when she's telling you that what everybody is doing is essentially nothing, and that's part of the problem? Now, obviously, making a YouTube video doesn't kill people. Even making 20 YouTube videos about a dangerous conspiracy theory doesn't kill people. Murderers kill people. But there are quite a lot of potential 
potential murderers out there, and people with a large platform have a great deal of responsibility to understand not just their intention to make money talking about a cause or to inform people or whatever, but also to understand the effect of their words. Just because you are not the only cause or the main cause of the effect of your words does not mean that you don't have any responsibility at all about the effect of your words. Just because it's filtered through someone else's willpower does not mean that things could not have gone differently if you had done something differently. Sorry about all the negatives. Hope that makes sense. Lauren didn't tell the terrorist to kill people, and she didn't hand him the gun, but she did tell many people just like him who she thought the targets should be and why. Having a platform is a great deal of responsibility. It's like being an older sibling. Imagine you told your younger sibling about how evil your neighbors were, and you went on about it for years like it was this huge catastrophe. Imagine you told your younger sibling that this catastrophe was having dire consequences and would have even more consequences in the future if people continued ignoring them. That your way of life, your family, your culture, and who you are was in jeopardy because of these neighbors. Then imagine your younger sibling went and teepeed their house, or if your sibling had some real issues with reality, maybe they even lit the neighbor's house on fire or, or hurt them. Would that be your fault? My answer is partially. Sorry it's not black and white, but it's gray. You gotta deal with that. And if you're the kind of person that thinks in black and white and you would try to deny you had any responsibility in the effects of your words just because it was filtered through your younger sibling's agency, then I think you would be in denial and you would not be understanding the complexities of free will and the influence we have on one another. I enjoy very much talking about these issues of responsibility and accountability and responding to criticism and I like how it connects with political issues that I'm passionate about, like challenging right-wing rhetoric. So I love making these videos and I'll probably keep doing it for quite a long time, but I really wanna thank the kind and generous and cool people on Patreon who send actual hard cash to support these videos. It really gives me a great boost to just feel what it's like to actually get monetary support for creative work. So thank you very much to Elise, Put my name in the credits, Winky Face, and a very cool anonymous person who hasn't told me yet if they want their name in the credits. If that's you, you know, respond to my message on Patreon. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to share it with your friends or your enemies, and you should probably subscribe to this channel if you've watched this much, honestly. There are lots of other videos on the channel that you can check out, including another one critiquing Lauren for the way she talks about the COVID pandemic, and I have a bunch of other political and non-political videos videos as well. Thanks for taking the time to delve into these subjects with me. Hopefully you found this interesting and worth pursuing. It's not about a YouTube takedown, it's about raising our levels of accountability about the consequences of our actions. I think people sometimes think of therapy and therapists as people who sort of take responsibility away from people, like, oh, it's not your fault, X, Y, and Z, it was all your parents' fault, and so on. That's definitely not what I do, and I don't think that's what any effective therapy does. I do think think therapy is very helpful for helping people sort through things that were actually their fault that they don't take responsibility for, so they could maybe start taking responsibility and maybe change things that is within their control. But yes, part of it is also about understanding what was not your fault and what you don't need to take responsibility for, but it's a balance. It's very important to have both sides to understand the effects you have on the world, because those effects obviously come back to you. So I think a lot about this stuff, and intent is not always the important thing. It just doesn't matter whether Lauren Southern intended on inspiring terrorism. I mean, it matters but even if she didn't, it's still worth talking about how her words may affect others. But she seems unwilling to take responsibility for the rhetoric that she has spread and the ideology she propagates, and I think that's a big issue, frankly. Um, okay, I can't end a video on the word frankly, that would seem kind of weird, so yeah, goodbye!